traditional archives were essentially there susceptible to fire and flood and uh, deliberate damage. So this talk is in three parts. There's an overview of what it is that we're building, how it works. Um, then there's a deep dive into the economics. And a yellow paper just went live on our website on, I think, Monday. So you can get into that afterwards if it interests you. As well as a sort of more explorative section on um, decentralized autonomous web applications, which is one of the use cases for the Rweave that we think will be pretty uh, effective longer term and has much deeper consequences than you would sort of originally realize when you think, oh, well, it's just decentralizing Facebook, something like that. OK, so the first thing you need to know about how Rweave works is that it's not based on a blockchain. It's based on what we call a block weave. Block weave is similar to a blockchain in that it includes a hash of the last block with the transactions in the current block in the production of the next block. However, what is different is that it also requires miners to uh, recall a previous block from the network, which is chosen at random, or pseudo-random, um, yeah, for inclusion. What this means is that if you're a miner, you have an incentive to store those old blocks because you're not sure when they're going to be recalled. This enforces something that we call proof of access, that you have to prove that you have access to old data in order to be able to mine new blocks in the network. And it essentially leads to um, a kind of equilibrium in um, mining expenditure for nodes in the network between hashing in a traditional sense and also storage of data. It also leads to extremely high levels of replication of data in the system. So at the moment, there's around 400 nodes in the Rweave network, and there's around 350 replications of each piece of data on these nodes, simply as a consequence of the incentive structure that this creates. And this isn't just good for replication. It's actually extraordinarily good for the fundamental problem of decentralized file storage which is, OK, so I've got this network. It's got data in it, but how am I going to find that data? And this is a problem that you know, people have been trying to solve since 1997. The first attempt was with Nutella, which was the first distributed file storage system. Um, and they created this algorithm called Kademnia. And basically, all of the other decentralized file storage networks that exist today use Kademnia. And they're just as slow as it was in 1997. We found a kind of, I guess, hack that solves this problem of like, OK, how do I find the data in the network by essentially incentivizing that data to be everywhere? That makes finding the data extraordinarily simple. So if you like, look at this in practice, it'll take you, on average, we know because we spent a lot of time working with this system, in IPFS, like seven minutes or so to find an average piece of data. In Arweave, the likelihood is the first machine you speak to is going to have that data. That means you can serve it back to the users in like sub 200 milliseconds, which means that if you store web applications on top of the system, they're served to users at a kind of speed where they can actually use it, and they don't even realize they're interacting with a decentralized storage network. So this really changes the game, we think. So that's the base layer, the block weave. And that's uh, the first iteration of a block weave in the wild is R weave. And on top of the R weave, we have this layer that we call the permaweb. So the basic idea behind the perm web is this. The centralized web loses 98.4% of its contents every 20 years. This is absolutely insane, considering that we use the web as the fundamental point, uh, or really the source of information and knowledge in modern societies. It's insane that we're losing almost all of it every 20 years. With the perm web, things are different. It's built on Arweave's sustainable economics for permanent storage as a consequence it remains 100% with, well, with integrity forever, just simply doesn't forget. So what we're trying to build here is a kind of library of Alexandria that doesn't suck. <laughs> it's completely impervious to fire. fire. It can't be burnt down by uh, marauding armies. It just stores information forever. And it does so across many, many jurisdictions. It's really owned by the people and governed by the people rather than any specific government or institution. The effect that we would like to see that have on society is a solution to this. He who controls the past controls the future. He who controls the present controls the past. So we would like to make it so that controlling understanding of the past is a collective activity that anyone can take part in with their computer rather than it being a, well, I run the archive, so I get to choose 
what is or what isn't inside it, and when things are deleted. Maybe things are modified, as you know, in the Soviet Union, they were all the time. But this isn't just theory, this is practice. So this is an article that came out nearly a year ago now with someone that, um, yeah, someone in our community during the Kerch Strait naval incident between Russia and Ukraine uh, back in, I think it was December last year, they started archiving all of the news reports about it. And they caught a uh, Sputnik article. It was the first English language piece by the Russian government about what had happened in Ukraine. And something was very strange with it. It was immensely pro-Ukrainian. It's really very odd. And it was deleted from their website 15 minutes later and replaced with a pro-Russian article. Okay, that's kind of interesting. And then some journalists caught onto it and the Daily Express, this is a sort of major mainstream newspaper in the UK, wrote an article using this, um, yeah, this evidence essentially that was stored inside the PermaWeb. And just a few weeks ago, we found this. It's not just, um, I guess, traditionally authoritarian governments that actually use these kinds of tactics. Yeah, this is a press release from the Italian government that when the government changed, they memory hold or attempted to memory hold all of the press releases from the last few years on their website. But because members of our community managed to hoover them up and put them on the Arweave, they're there and you can verify that this is the information um, as it was at the time of recording. So we can absolutely verify with 100% guarantee that this hasn't been modified in the intervening period. So data usage on the network has been growing pretty monumentally recently, uh, and it continues to do so pretty much month on month. So that's what Arweave is. But like, there's a really good question here, which is how on earth can you make it so you can store a piece of information forever for a single fee? That just doesn't sound like it's possible, right? Okay, well, the short answer is this. We make an endowment that pays for the storage of data over time. So when you put a piece of information into the system, you pay for the storage of that information upfront for 200 years. Sounds like that's very expensive, but actually storage is so cheap that that costs like half a cent per megabyte. Which, if you're thinking on the order of like, I'm going to store my web apps, I'm going to store some web pages, this is perfectly affordable. Then, over time, the cost of storage declines. And this gives you essentially a kind of interest on the principle that 200 years worth of storage you've already put aside. And in fact, if the cost of storage decline, oh, my, okay, I'm waiting for connection. Excellent, go blind. <laughs> um, yeah, if the cost of storage decline stays above 0.5%, then you can go on indefinitely in this fashion, just like you do with a normal endowment. So, okay, is 0.5% conservative enough? Well, over the last 50 years, it's been declining at a rate of around 30.5% per, per year. And we'll get to some sort of hard constraints on that in a moment. So, in order to make this work, that's the kind of outline. The real mathematics of it are, you need to first define a metric for how, how much does it cost to store a piece of data for an hour, to store a gigabyte for an hour. And this is really very simple. Just take the cost of the hard drive, the size of the hard drive, and the mean time between failures of the hard drive, you smash all these together, and sure enough, you can work out how much it costs to store a gigabyte for an hour. Okay, cool. So then you plot it, and you see, whoa, this is the logarithmic scale. That's quite the pattern we have there. Okay, cool, so the storage prices have been declining. So if I put some data in at the beginning there, then how much is it gonna cost to go across indefinitely. So we just sum it up, sum the area under the curve. Okay, so this begs a question. It's like, yeah, Sam, that's all right, fine. Uh, you can do it like that, but surely that you're gonna get to some limits at some point. It's like, yeah, that's definitely true. But let's look at where we are relative to the fundamental limits of the storage um, medium. And we see that, okay, currently the maximum data storage capacity you can get in a consumer hard drive is one, point whatever times 10 to the power 12, right? That's pretty dense, you would think. But then we realize, actually, no, in research, we've already reached 10 to the power 25. That's quite the increase. It takes a lot of years of 30% growth before you get from 10 to the power 12 to 10 to the power 25. But then you find that, actually, the, um, the limits that define truly how many bits of information you can get inside a single centimeter cube they're at like 10 to the power 67. So, okay, how long does that go on for? 
Well, if we go at 30% per year, then we're looking at 434 years before we reach that maximum point. And this is just looking at data uh, density, not including data reliability. And data reliability, we actually think it's harder to quantify because the limits are much more complex, but we think that data reliability will increase much, much more so than even data density. So this pattern and this kind of storage endowment system will work for at least 434 years, if not much more likely thousands of years. Okay, cool. So with that all behind us, you can get into the real mathematics, and I'll skim through this, but if you're interested, you can look at our yellow paper that's on our website. We basically just need to say, all right, so at any given time point, what is the size of the data and how much does it cost to store a gigabyte for an hour? And we just sum up that infinite series, and because the storage cost is declining, it comes out at a finite fee for indefinite storage. Okay, cool, so that works at like a mathematical level, but how do you actually implement that? So the one thing you've got to know is like, for every single block in the block weave, the reward in total that goes to miners must be greater than or equal to the size of the weave in gigabytes times the gigabyte uh, storage cost for the period of one block. Pretty simple, sounds reasonable. And then you get into the transaction pricing and you really, we won't get into this too much, but it's basically along those lines. And then mining and payments, kind of similar. So you're just summing up the rewards between miners and you're taking some portion from the pool in each time step, giving it to the miner as well as inflation rewards and then pooling calculations. But TLDR is just our weave transactions add to a storage endowment. The endowment pays for the storage over time. And that's how you achieve permanent storage of data. And here's an example of what that mathematics looks like in practice, so you can really get your head around it. If we assume 30.5% um, storage decline in cost per year, as it does or has done over the last 50 years, at the end of the first year, we have 260 years worth of storage paid for up front. At the end of the second year, we've got 338. And the critical thing is here, you're using part of the capital, but you're actually raising the implied, um, yeah, essentially the amount of storage you can buy at the end of each year. And so you simply just never deplete it. Okay, so that's how the economics of the system works. And now this is sort of more speculative, <laughs> a more speculative part of the talk where I'd like to like, consider, okay, so imagine you've got a web application that you've built on a weekend. Say it's like a decentralized discussion forum. You launch it on the Arweave, it's like, I don't know, 30 kilobytes or something, so it's cost you some tenths of a penny. Okay, now anyone can come along in a completely permissionless manner and they can use your forum to talk to each other. And you as the application developer, you're really like, your interaction with this system is done. What we're talking about here is decentralized, autonomous web applications that are very similar in effect to smart contracts on Ethereum, except with web services that consumers can use. And the really cool thing here is that although they look very similar to normal web services, you just point your browser at like an address and it renders and it looks like a normal UI, it entirely changes the incentive structures for people building the applications themselves. So one way of thinking about this is like, okay, let's imagine I've built a uh, discussion forum that for some reason becomes very popular. So I build this thing over a weekend, uh, I release it to the world and I say, hey look, here's my discussion forum but every post has a picture of a duck uh, and everyone likes ducks and so, you know, people start to use this forum. Okay, fine, so it's gaining adoption. Okay, so my one server that I was paying $7 a month to Amazon for is suddenly not enough. Okay, now I've got two servers and more and more. And the more people use my application, the more I have to pay to run the application. This is a pretty big deal because it means the developer is forced to do one of two things pretty much immediately, as soon as they get traction. They must either heavily monetize, which slows growth rate, or they take VC funding, which is essentially selling future value from the product down the line um, that has to be extracted in some fashion. These lead to, I would say, dubious incentives for the users of these web services. Like a really good example is Gmail. When I signed up to Gmail in 2007 or whenever it was, I didn't know what Google was going to do with my data. I just signed away. I said, yeah, 
Seems good, you're offering it for free. But now they're offering everyone this service for free. So you've got to find some way of making money from it. Well, with Arweave applications, it's pretty different. Once the developer is done producing and launching the application itself, they don't have to pay for it anymore. If users want to interact with it, if they want to, um, I don't know, send a message in Weavemail, for example, which is the decentralized Weavemail, sorry, decentralized email application in the Perma web, then they pay a tiny, tiny fee from the balance which is intrinsically linked to their identity on the Perma web. You can think of this like their, um, it's kind of like they have a pay-as-you-go phone, which is associated with a mobile number. And they can just make payments with this system in a way that is just as easy as logging into Facebook in the first place. And what this means is now the developer doesn't have the burden of paying for the usage of the users. So their incentives are entirely different. And we think that actually the different incentives that you get with this push developers to build applications that are better for users, not necessarily better for extracting value from users. That's pretty powerful. Another strange thing about DAWAs is that they are completely ownerless. So they aren't controlled by a single party. Let's think back to our discussion platform idea. Well, OK, in fact, this exists on the Perm web. There are three discussion forums already. They're completely ownerless, and so as a consequence, they're governed by the code is law kind of mentality. So one of these discussion forums, actually these discussion forums use different moderation policies, but those policies are baked into the code itself. Then as a user, as part of a community, on these platforms, you know exactly how each issue is going to be handled in the future. There's none of this kind of, oh, well, we should appeal to the X, the developers, to change their policy. This kind of takes out this uh, problem that you have if you build a sort of central, sorry, social networking platform, just along the lines of, OK, well, I built a social networking platform. It's become very popular. Hooray, great for me. Except now I've got this terrible problem, which is like, well, people want me to ban people for saying things or doing certain things. It's like, OK, so if I do, the free speech people are going to hate me. And if I don't, the other people are going to hate me. And it's a no-win situation. So one of the things that happens on the Perma web is you get to choose which gateway you use to access the system. And the gateways impose a content policy. So if you have a more conservative point of view and you're not happy about people swearing on your web, the web that you see, then you just access it through a more conservative gateway and all of the applications by default without the developer changing a single line of code uh, react to your preferences without those preferences being imposed on other people. So there's this sort of democratic layer in the protocol, which allows you to deal with content moderation. But also, at the application level, everybody can see clearly how things are going to be governed in the future. So they also encourage users to pay for their own usage. This sounds like it's a negative thing. But paying for your own usage is actually so cheap that if you could, if you could have Facebook, for example, and it charged you, I don't know, half a cent per month, something like that, but instead, it didn't sell your data to anyone. Uh, it kept everything private, and you didn't have to see adverts. You'd probably pay for it. And we can make it so seamless that you don't even realize you're doing it in the first place. So we actually think this is a pretty major feature of this ecosystem, which gives rise to the final, well, second final component, which is that, OK, so now the, user, sorry, now the developer doesn't have to pay for their application more if it becomes popular. Well, you can just build open source websites. Like, has anyone ever wondered here why it was that open source took off on the server side? It also kind of took off on mobile via Android, but we never really saw open source servers, oh, sorry, open source web services. We think that the reason for that is because the more people use it, the more the developer has to pay. That just makes it uh, incompatible with open source software. But as I was saying, we've really changed the incentives here, and that no longer applies. Now we can maybe have an ecosystem of web services that put the user's desires first, not treating the user as a product. Finally, DAWAs maintain consumer integrity. You go to Weavemail today, you use it in its current form, and you can be confident that at any point in the future, you can come back to it as it is right now, and you can use it like that again. This is important because 
you've got to contrast it with stuff on the centralized web, I guess. So let's think back to our um, discussion forum for duck-related images, whatever it happens to be. OK, so it gets very popular, and people um, have raised money from VCs. And then now, at some point, they reach kind of like the tipping point of adoption. They say, OK, well, you've basically hoovered up the whole market. Now is the time to extract value from it. And from a user's point of view, this tends to lead to a decline in the quality of the service being offered. Pump web apps are very different. What you see is what you get forever. If, you've, if you're happy with your email client as it is today, you will always be able to access it like that. Nobody can take your, away your ability to do so. This changes the incentive for developers. Now, if I want to update my application, I don't just change where, you know, permamail.com goes to. I have to actually give people something better than they had before. And all of this, in conclusion, increases the uh, quality of experience for consumers of web services, which I think is actually a pretty major part of how our society works today. So thank you. That was a, I guess, outline of what Arweave is, what we're thinking about, and how the economics work. All right, Sam, thank you for that overview. Uh, if anyone here wants to go over some math proofs later, Sam, Sam is happy to walk you through them. He walked us through most of them, I think, during the diligence process. I think so. Uh, speaking of diligence, uh, you had some big news a couple days ago. What happened? <laughs> well, I mean, we announced our fundraising round. Um, well, it wasn't really a round. We simply sold people tokens. Um, yeah, with Multicoin, USV, and Andreessen Horowitz Crypto. Um, awesome. Well, congrats again. We're super excited to have you as part of the Arweave portfolio. Um, before we jump into like the meat of the permaweb and where this is all going, let's just start off with a little background on Sam. How did you, how did you end up in all this? Well, um, I was doing a PhD in disputed operating system design. And I'd always been interested in blockchains, like since before Bitcoin got parity with the dollar, somewhere around that period. And then I, I took part in the Ethereum ICO because I wanted to program a global world computer, as I remember it said on their website at the time. Uh, yeah, I was always kind of interested in it, but I hadn't been deeply in it. And then it was like the, it was the spring after the 2016 election, and the whole world was abuzz with this problem of like fake news. How are we going to adjudicate the truthiness of things on the web? And it occurred to us pretty strongly that, like, OK, well, there's no archive of what people are saying on the web that is actually verifiable. Like, there's things like the Internet Archive, but if you politely ask them, hey, would you remove this piece of information, they, they absolutely will. Yeah, so there's no verifiable archive of knowledge and history. And it occurred to us, well, blockchains are pretty good at storing data in a distributed and replicated way, uh, such that it cannot be censored or altered at a later point but they obviously don't scale. And so I guess we put our heads to solving the data storage scaling problems with blockchains. Okay, so when a lot of people hear about Arweave, if they've been around crypto, they may have heard about this thing called Filecoin that raised a whole bunch of money back in 2017 and has not yet shipped Filecoin, but you know, they're working on it. Um, how do you think, what, what, how is Arweave different than Filecoin? Well, if, A, what is Filecoin so they don't understand, and then B, how is it different? Yeah, so Filecoin is just a um, decentralized, semi-trustful, uh, temporary information storage system. Arweave is a decentralized, trustless, permanent information storage system. So we're really going after different kind of markets, I would say. C can you un unpack, so when you say it's a t temporary storage, like there's contracts involved, like just give us a little more color for, for folks here who aren't deep in uh, distributed systems all day. Of course, right. So with Filecoin, you say to the network, hey, can I get 10 copies of this file stored for this period of time? They say, okay, well, there's a market. We're going to charge you this amount for it. All right, fine. So you put the file into the system, and then there has to be some kind of verification mechanism that talks to the chain. So I think with Filecoin, and um, if I'm correct, also with Sia at the moment, you basically have this problem of like someone's got to observe the data that you're storing in the network. Uh, Arweave takes like a totally different approach. We, we basically found this kind of um, solution to the scalability problem for decentralized storage 
where you say, well, treat everything as one. And then instead of having a contract for every single piece of data that has to be adjudicated independently, if we have one contract, contract-like thing, uh, for the storage of all data, then we can just adjudicate the storage of that one thing, and we can do that by sampling. That makes it much, much more scalable uh, in terms of the amount of data or uh, pieces of data that it can hold. All right, so let's move in a tiny little different direction. You talked a little bit about kind of the endowment model and, and tokens, but the Arweave token model is actually one of the most important things about it and was ultimately one of the biggest reasons why we invested. Can you explain to everyone just in a little more detail how it works and how it ultimately captures value? Yeah, I mean, well, we started with the Bitcoin model, right? You pay per byte in a transaction. It's just now our transactions contain many, many more bytes. Uh, and then instead of the, the tokens going directly from the payer for the transaction into um, the hands of the miner who produced that one particular block, uh, we move most of those tokens into the endowment. And the endowment just collects money over time, or not money, but tokens over time, and distributes them to miners in order to keep the sustain, yeah, in order to sustain uh, the, well, we call it the storage burden, which is not a very PR friendly uh, name, but that's what it is, it's the burden of storage of the network. And so, yeah, you just take from the endowment over time in order to keep that profitable. What, just kind of a side note, one of the things that drew us most on this is that a lot of systems in crypto said, hey, you're going to pay for service X or Y or Z in this token. Um, and are we, at first glance, we were like, oh, it's that same model, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why we don't like that model. What really drew us to the system, though, is that actually it kind of structurally accrues value because people are paying in, and then the tokens stay locked in the endowment and get paid out over time. And so as demand grows for the system, right, you're increasing the size of that endowment, um, and so that ultimately creates kind of a velocity sink. And so as net new demand comes in, it basically forces, um, forces price up. And so it's one of the most just innovative novel things about the system. There's really nothing else out there quite like it. Um, and yeah, we think it's going to be super compelling for, for long-term value capture with our wave. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like token burn from the point of view of the, yeah. Uh, but, but they're locked in the, in the endowment for a while. Um, okay. So let's talk about, you know, this thing has been out. It launched in June of 2018. Um, it's been out now for almost 18 months. People are starting to do some stuff with this. What, what kind of applications are actually running today? A couple of examples would be good. Yeah, of course. So um, one of the first things people built was a decentralized medium replacement. So at the time, everyone was getting pretty pissed off that medium was on that. Uh, well, I sort of described this pattern, right? So they went through a period at the beginning of massive, massive growth that was funded by um, investors that wanted to make sure they captured money back from the system, the greater value than they put into it later. And so what happened there was everybody sort of loved um, Medium for a long time, but then they started to sort of monetize and they, people realized, well, hey, my Medium articles that I'm posting, are actually, you know, they're going to be gate kept and people are gonna to have to pay to see them and Medium is making money from it. And so there's a lot of dissatisfaction with that model. So one of the early things people built on the system was, well, decentralized blogging platform. You come along, you pay with Arweave's token, um, and you can manage your own blog on the system. It's very simple, and you can be confident that it's not going to try and exploit you later. That's just one example, for example. <laughs> one example. Um, another would be that people built a kind of decentralized Quora system. So you come along and you say, okay, I've got a question I want an answer to, um, and you post it. Again, you just log in with your Arweave key file, and then your identity is linked uh, intrinsically with some sort of balance of tokens that you can use to pay for posting um, questions, which will cost you like you know, a tenth or a thirtieth of a, a cent. Yeah, you can come along, you ask a question, and then people can reply, and it looks just like a normal web application, except when you upvote, you're actually giving a tiny tip which is kind of cool because now you have this tip curated registry of answers to things. And the people that are giving the best answers are gaining the most uh, tips from it. So yeah, there's lots of interesting economic dynamics that happen like that in the network. Yeah, as, as we, um, the medium example to me is pretty, you know, as an, as an author, it, it's particularly um, close to home. I know actually quite a few people who they publish stuff on medium and like they put it behind a paywall. And like, if your goal is to maximize your reach when you publish things and you don't want a paywall explicitly, Medium reserves the right to do that against your free will. So ironically, the people who produce the best content that gets the most traffic are the people that Medium's business model right now works explicitly against. 
Uh, and so I think this is actually a really powerful idea. And, and we've started to see people move away from a lot of the big centralized platforms like YouTube and Medium and these kinds of things. So we're pretty excited for Arweave to kind of capture that, that trend as it continues to grow. Uh, okay, so Sam, Arweave has been live for about 18 months. What do you think is going to happen over the next 12 if you can make any predictions about the future? Just, you know, stuff happening on the, on the Arweave, new features, those kinds of things. Well, so there's two sides of this, right? There's kind of future development, and because it's an archive, there's also like past development, right? So when things are added, I'll, I'll cover past first because that sounds stranger. Like when things are added to the network, they're normally added from a replica that's found on the centralized web. But of course, our system is permanent, and the centralized web is very, very, very impermanent. And so over time, more and more of the sources that are backed up on the Arweave are lost from the centralized web. And this essentially makes the Arweave the single source of truth for absolutely verifiably unmodified copies of that data over time. And so we're going to start to see that grow now. Um, and we already are. Like, we're getting lots of interesting pieces of information that you can now only find on the perma web, uh, nowhere else in, in the world. So that will happen naturally over time. But on the other side, we're looking at, um, yeah, essentially application development is what it's all about for us. And we're now at this stage, we kind of went through like the hackathon phase where you know, people were building these apps that you could see they could roughly work, but, but they weren't really going to attract end users to actually applications that we're pretty sure now can attract end users that aren't even from crypto. Um, like as long as we can get people used to this, okay, log in with a key file idea, which is actually pretty simple and the UIs for it are quite nice, um, then yeah, I think we could start to see, dare I say, mainstream adoption of some of those ideas. So there's that happening, and then um, further, I think like the next beachhead is into startups. So can we get it so that people can start companies on top of the utility that is provided sort of uniquely by this uh, mechanism and by this network? I mean, you can't buy permanent information storage anywhere else. It just is not an offering that can be given credibly because it's always associated with a centralized company, which can go bust. This network is not owned by anyone, and its uh, economics are self-sustaining. So yeah, we think that there's a huge opportunity there for people to build startups that are playing with that mechanism. Like, let's apply it to, um, yeah, uh, legal tech. Let's make a simple system for people to store their corporate contracts in an encrypted manner, forever, verifiably. It's very simple, very easy value proposition. Someone just needs to go out and do it. Um, yeah, and why don't we just apply it to uh, the architecture field, which it turns out has really, really stringent um, reporting requirements. So you have to make sure you keep your architectural documents, at least in Germany, for like 50 years. And if you don't do so, then you can be fined enormous amounts of money. A, a small architecture firm trying to make their own system for storing information for 50 years is a joke. Simply not going to happen. The drives will fail, and someone at some point will forget to copy the data onto other drives. Our system just completely abstracts away that. It says, OK, give me your drawing. And then the incentives and the decentralized network itself governs uh, making sure that there are replicas over time. So yeah, there's just hundreds of examples like this for permanent information storage that you, you, couldn't, um, yeah, you couldn't build solutions to it quite like this before. We think people are going to start picking up and building startups with them. Uh, awesome. I think we're good for some questions, right? I think so. I think we got a few questions coming in. Yes, we do. I'm just pulling up Telegram, sorry. Does anyone in the audience have one in the meantime? All right. I'll get I think I see a hand in the middle of the room here. Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, really remarkable. Um, what, what is your data model? What are the implications for search? Well, that's an interesting one. So because the Arweave, every node in it is just a HTTP server, it can be trivially integrated with other things. In fact, so trivially that we realized about a year after launch, no, 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 maybe six months after launch, oh, Google has indexed the entire PermaWeb. Just because it's HTTP, you get that integration for free. Somebody had left a link to a um, block explorer somewhere that Google picked up, and then it was like, oh, okay, well, let me try all these links out, and sure enough, it scraped the entire network. So <laughs> now you can search the entire PermaWeb just with Google. Um, and someone made a nice front end for that as well. It's called like rfind.org. You go there, you just type in whatever you want, it uses Google search to, to look through the entire block weave. So yeah, from the point of view of search, like we're trivially integrated with every existing search engine. But of course, you can make sort of always specific ones. 
Um, I have the next one. Uh, love the idea. When will our weave mining get beyond using command lines for setup? And do you have plans for better UI? It's an interesting one. Um, mining competition has been so strong that it hasn't been our focus. Like we've been really focused on um, the demand side of the market. Supply actually just kind of came by default. We didn't ever go out and ask people, "Hey, you should, you know, you should start mining. It's got this kind of return, that kind of thing." And already, like, there was so much demand that it really pushed down the profit margin to quite slim. So I think, like, to be honest, I think that the, the best thing for mining will be increased liquidity. So at the moment, one of the, the um, I guess, less strong suits of the network is that, like, you can only trade it on two very small exchanges. So we're working on major exchange integration. Um, and after that, we think that, yeah, there'll be more sort of miners of the, like, I know what you call them, like hobby, you know, the guys with the garages filled with miners. Those guys coming along and, and running nodes just because there's easy in and out liquidity uh, to the network. So I think that's the next stage on that part. Um, and then after that, potentially we'll look at more, um, I guess, what would you call it, like a friendly UIs. But really, like, we're very focused on the demand side because that is what we see needing sort of kickstarting rather than supply. One other note I'll just add is that if you're curious in purchasing Arbif tokens, they're not easy to acquire today, but there is a weird secondary market. Uh, if you guys have questions on how to do that yourselves, just ask any of the multi-coin team and we can point you in the right direction. Yep. Hey, uh, thanks for being here. I, I had a question about kind of like regulation and, and privacy rights. So how do you think about whether it's the right to be forgotten in GDPR or users who may want to remove their own data from the internet, but it's stored on the R-Weave. Like what kind of rights do the users and the authors of the data have in whether it's stored or for how long? Yeah, so that's a really interesting one we've put a lot of thought into. There's three layers of protection for content in the network. The first is when you put a piece of content into the network. First, every, rather a majority of the miners in the network have to agree that the content in question should be allowed in. And there are very interesting incentive games at play here, which is essentially that like, okay, if I think that there's a reasonably high likelihood that the rest of the network is going to reject a piece of content, then I also should reject that piece of content. Because if I put it into a block, and I find, so I try and put it into a block, and then I actually find the block, I distribute it to the network, and then it gets rejected, I've lost a huge amount of potential reward. So I want to act kind of conservatively in that regard. But similarly, I don't want to act too conservatively, because if I do so, I will lower the amount of tokens that I get when I mine that block, and also the tokens that are going to come out of the endowment over the long period. And so this creates a sort of very intense Pareto distribution, where essentially in the corner, you get all the truly reprehensible kinds of content that almost everyone in the globe can agree, we don't want to store that permanently. Hell no and everything else is allowed through. And this gets to the second layer, which says, okay, so I'm a miner in the system. I get rewarded proportionately to the data that I store, but I don't have to store everything. And unlike in contract-based systems, so like in Filecoin or Seer, you are assigned a piece of data to store. You don't get to choose. And as a consequence, you really, like if you get stuck with some piece of data you find morally reprehensible, then you either take a cut from your collateral that you've put up, or you just, you just stick it out. And so that leads to just a whole other set of problems we can get into, like offline, if you like. But, but in our weave, you can just say, OK, so I simply am not going to take part in um, storing that information. And what's actually nice about this is comp in comparison to the centralized web where, OK, so some piece of information is made publicly available. Now there's copies of it like all over the place. And there's no easy way of contacting everyone that has a copy. In our weave, it's the, totally the opposite. You can easily send a message to absolutely everyone in the network and say, OK, please don't store this piece of data for me for this reason. So that's the second layer. Uh, the third layer is most people are going to access the Arweave network through a gateway, for the foreseeable future at least, like 98%. And this goes back to what I was talking about before. The gateways can um, apply the same kind of content policies uh, that the miners do. So the miners can choose, I don't want to store anything that says the word dog in it or whatever it happens to be. Um, well, the gateways will do the same thing, and then you can find a dog-free gateway. And so essentially, yeah, as a, as a gateway provider or as a storer in the system, you are responsible for the data you store, and you have choices about which data you store. And from the point of view of a gateway, you're also serving that to users as well. So yeah, you have the legal responsibility to act appropriately within those bounds, and we give you the tools to do so. 
Great. I have another question from Telegram. Um, what are the most promising type startups to be built on the Perma web? So I think the the most obvious one where I can see like there's a huge amount of value to capture like absolutely trivially is just someone got to come along and build like a legal tech startup around this. Just something very basic like okay, you give me a document, I timestamp it into the network. There we go. You can prove it's basically like notarization in a digital form. Um, yeah, that's enormously cheap and effective. Uh, yeah, you could, you could totally make a, a startup around this if you actually knew how to sell to lawyers, which we don't. And that's why we're sort of looking to work with teams that have, uh, I guess, domain-specific knowledge and backgrounds that we can tap into. Another one from Telegram. Um, how do you balance pricing in the network with the increasing price of the token over time? Ah, this is a really interesting one. Yeah, so we have fiat, stable, or fiat price stabilization mechanisms. They essentially try and detect, uh, okay, so at this benchmark point in time, this was set in version 1.8, uh, at this benchmark point in time, how much value is being expended by miners? So how much hashing is being done? How much storage is being done? Uh, for what token price? And then over time, you can kind of extrapolate, well, there's this much hashing power happening, and uh, the the efficiency of miners should have increased approximately on this curve, and so you can approximate fiat price of your own token inside the system without using um, any kind of oracle, uh, yeah, while deploying that method. So that's what we do in that regard. And then essentially as the token becomes more scarce, so fewer tokens outside of the pool, um, there'll be more people competing for a smaller quantity of tokens, and as a consequence, the network can realize, well, hey, that must mean that my token price in fiat value has gone up substantially. This is actually quite nice because as the US dollar devalues, it won't be affected. We're just talking kind of generic value units here. Um. Okay, another one. So we have the whole interesting ecosystem of rights about around uh, data and around information and the storage ownership access rights. So from this perspective, what's RBF doing around enterprise storage, enterprise class storage, or storage that places like hospitals will need for their patients' data? So we think that the most likely beachhead there is people running private Arweave instances that post hashes onto the main Arweave network. This is obviously nowhere near as good from the point of replication of data, uh, but it does give you verifiable timestamping of that information. Um, yeah, so that's where we see people starting to use it in enterprise. Um, and then eventually over time they'll actually get comfortable with the idea of like, okay, so the PermaWeb is this big reliable thing that I can just put my data onto and it'll be there forever. But we don't think that, you know, enterprise is going to pick this up tomorrow and start doing that. I think that's quite unlikely. And one of the things we're doing in that area um, to make that more likely, I guess, is looking at, okay, so we have these permanence guarantees, right? And it's an open source protocol and spec. So why don't we build SLAs? Like, why don't we find people that can ensure that some file stored in the Arweave will be available at some point in the future to some value if it's not? And this, we think, will make enterprises much more comfortable. I mean, people already do this with TCP IP, right? TCP says, okay, I can guarantee that your packet is going to be delivered under this set of technical, um, I guess, circumstances. So the people then make SLAs around this and they guarantee it with money, with fiat value. They say, yep, I can be sure that your packet's gonna get there because I understand how the protocol works uh, and I have confidence that it'll work like this in the future. So yeah, we're starting the process of looking for partners that might actually be able to ensure uh, essentially against the potential like uh, problems with the PermaWeb uh, for some fiat value, which we hope will make enterprises more comfortable with it. Any other questions? Great. All right, I think that's all. So thank you to our guests on this session. Let's give them a round of applause and we'll uh, get ready to invite the thank next you. session up. Yeah.